to Monday. Uh, Monday starts a new week at Unsolved No More, as you know, and this week, after a week's hiatus, I needed it in order to research this next case that we're doing this week, because uh, it's a convoluted one, and it is the Stephen Avery, Brendan Dossie making of a murderer. Now, obviously, I've heard about this one, but I never really followed it. Um, to be honest, I really didn't have much interest in sitting down and watching 10 episodes of a series. Um, but then this never had time. This week I made time to do it. And I'm glad I did. It was, uh, well worth it. So, this week, I'm not going to tip my, my hand at all and let, uh, you guys know which way I'm thinking on this. I will say there is there is basically two sides of this. That Stephen Avery was framed or he committed murder. Now there's a lot more that goes into it, obviously, but those are basically the two camps that you'll fall into. I'll let you know where I fall after you know I do some more research. So what I like to do is just like the Starved Rock murders, and I think uh, there was another one that had a documentary. I like watching the documentary to give me a feel. I don't go off the documentaries much because usually they're biased one way or another. Um, I think of, what was that, Woody Allen documentary Woody verse or Alan V Pharaoh I think it was very slanted um, so anyhow I watched that just to get a get familiarized with the case before I dive into the transcripts police reports uh, things of that nature and make my own assessments so that's what I've been doing all week now this was a like I said a very complex case but what it's going to come down to is the meticulous looking at the evidence and looking and no case more than this looking at possibilities and probabilities 10 episodes that was just the first season and there's a second season out and I watched some of the first episode of that um, but I'm going to research that further as well So things that we're going to look at, just like we do in every case, the victimology. In here, uh, Teresa Hollabach, she was 25 years old. She was a uh, photographer. She went missing on October 31st. I couldn't believe that when I seen it. How many people that, I, that we have just looked into within the past three months have gone missing on October 31st or got killed? I mean, just off the top of my head, you know, you have this one. I had a case, Jennifer Hill, Don Miller, Martha Moxley. That's just four. And I know there's another one in there. I know there is, and I just can't think of it. It's unreal. I don't know if I'll ever go out on October 31st again. My goodness. I mean, I know it's the devil's night. But wow, so many. That, those are just the ones that we looked at, right? 
So anyhow, she goes missing October 31st, 2005. Her last known photography appointment was at the Stephen Avery residence. He is subsequently arrested and charged and that gets into whether the evidence, because the evidence there was certainly sufficient for an arrest, but was it planted? Now, why would they plan evidence, you say? Well, at the same time this was going on, I mean the same time, the exact day, Stephen Avery was going through a deposition for a lawsuit against the county that he was arrested in. Stephen Avery had been arrested 20 years earlier, 1985, I want to say, for a rape, a sexual assault of a woman on a beach. He did 18 years in prison until DNA exonerated him. We're going to get into that, but he was exonerated. The Innocence Project took up his case, and he was found uh, not guilty, obviously. And another individual named Gregory Allen was arrested for that sexual assault. So in turn, Stephen Avery, via his attorneys, sue the county for wrongful imprisonment. Should he? Sure. Sure, he should. Why this is going on, he is, and, and it, let it be known, it was $36 million. So why this is going on, the missing person, Teresa Hallback, happens. Last known at place she was seen was Stephen Avery's residence. And there you have it. Evidence found at the scene included her blood in her car his blood in her car, her key in his bedroom, and the most important piece of evidence that was found was her remains. Her remains were found feet from his trailer, burned, and the only thing left was broken little pieces of charred bone. Now we're going to get into other pieces of evidence, whether they were planted, whether they were not. Um, if the opportunity was there to plant evidence, why, we kind of got into why somebody would plant evidence in this case. We're going to look at proclivities. We're going to look at the past of Stephen Avery, and we're going to look at a confession given by Stephen Avery's 16-year-old nephew, Brandon Dassey, who implicated himself and his uncle Stephen in this murder. And we'll get into what he says he saw and what he did to Teresa Hollabach on October 31st, 2005. We're going to talk about the length of the search. You know, when you do a search warrant, uh, you know, many hours, couple, maybe a day. This was eight days. Eight day search of this property. Granted, it was a big property, 40 acres. It was a junkyard. We're going to talk about some of the things that stand out to not just me, but other people. Um, how her vehicle, Teresa's vehicle, was found in this 40-acre junkyard with thousands of other vehicles within the first 30 minutes. Some people find that odd. Um, the key being found after it was already searched and it wasn't found. We're going to talk about his attorneys and my feelings towards them. We're going to look at the confession. We've gone through these type of confessions before. I think back to Chester Weger, the Starved Rock murders, that confession. West Memphis Three, that confession of Jesse Miss Kelly. Is this going to be one of those? Well, anytime there's a confession, there's going to be arguments that it was coerced 
and the manner in which the confession was obtained. I will let you know Wednesday on the deep dive what I feel about that confession, whether it was coerced, whether it was good, the tactics of the investigator, what I think about that. We're going to really dive into the evidence, okay? There will always be the other side of the evidence, what it shows because the implications of it being planted. But we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the timeline, and if it was possible, we're going to look at other suspects. Again, a very convoluted case, but I'm going to try to weed out the, the noise, the white noise that's all around this, and just kind of get back to what is the basics, and that is evidence proclivities, victimology, suspectology, those things are what's important. Yes, you're going to have the sprinkling in of, let's say, uh, appeals, depositions, lawsuits, innocence project, special prosecutors, conflicts of interest, That's, that's noise, okay? That's everything on the outside. Yes, you have to look at that. You have to look at the bigger picture. But don't let that influence your decision when it comes to evidence, proclivity, victimology, etc. And that's what we'll do. And that's what we always do on this channel, right? So, Stephen Avery making of a murderer all week tomorrow tuesday as always it's ken's key clue what did i see that kind of is leading me one way or another and just because i see that doesn't mean i'm going to go that direction but it's leading me that way i still got to look at everything but we'll get into that tuesday and then wednesday the deep dive we do everything thursday is the live chat you know members bring all your questions and I'll answer them. And then Friday I do a Q&A video. Mostly, I had some people ask, well, what's the difference between uh, the live Q&A and Friday's Q&A? Well, Thursday's live Q&A is for the members to ask. And then Friday I do the video and I'll, I'll go back and look at the comments and answer mostly questions and comments from non-members. That way everybody's taken care of. I will not be looking at comments on Mondays and Tuesdays. And the reason for that, I never want to be biased. I don't want to hear other people's opinions before I look into it myself. That's just the way I am. I don't want to know your thoughts. I don't want to know your theories. You can certainly leave them and I encourage that. I just won't be looking at them. Come Wednesday after I do the deep dive. Well, then I'll go back in and I'll, I'll look at things. So that's it for this week. Uh, solved or unsolved, Stephen Avery. Right now, I'm leaving it up to you guys. Solved or unsolved. And I'll let you know my thoughts come Wednesday's deep dive. So, hey, as always, Maine's out. Okay, welcome back. Tuesday, right into the content, Ken's key clue for the Stephen Avery Brendan Dossie case. Now, there's lots of evidence to look at, um, but I have a feeling no matter what I pick, somebody will say, well, it was planted. No wonder it's a key clue, right? It could be Teresa Hollabach's key to her RAV4, which was found in Stephen Avery's bedroom, or it could be the RAV4 itself which was found on the 40-acre junkyard property of Stephen Avery. That was hidden. By hidden, I mean some items placed on it, around it, license plate removed. Or it could be that Stephen Avery's blood that was inside the vehicle in a specific location that gave me pause for thought 
or it could be Teresa Hollabach's blood found in the back of the RAV4. Or, really, it could be Brendan Dossie's own confession. Now, all those things are very good clues. The 22, well, I'm not sure. Yeah, I want to say it was a 22 caliber bullet that was found in the garage that had Teresa Hollabach's DNA on it. And I forgot to mention that the key that was found in Stephen Avery's bedroom, not the first search, but in subsequent searches that had Stephen Avery's DNA on it. Could the key clue be the the non-publicized piece of evidence of Stephen Avery's DNA on the hood latch of Teresa's RAV4. Could that be it? No. It's none of that. Could the key clue be one of the police officers or detectives investigating the case. Could it be something in their background that would show their proclivity to plant evidence or a reason for why they would plant evidence? No. The key clue here is simple for me. And that key clue is Teresa Hollabox remains. That's my key clue. That is what makes me sway one way or another on this case to whether Stephen Avery and Brendan Dossie or Stephen Avery alone or Brendan Dossie alone or Bobby Dossie, who is another nephew of Stephen Avery, whether one of them or maybe Chucky, somebody else, a brother to Stephen Avery, somebody on that property is guilty. Which person? Well, I'll get into that Wednesday. Do I believe it was an outsider? You'll have to wait to Wednesday to find out. But my key clue and to figuring this out, in my opinion, rests in the charred remains, the bone fragments of Teresa Hollabach that was found on the Avery Junkyard property. Simple key clue. Maybe the most overlooked clue there is in this case. And why? Sometimes clues are so overwhelming that we tend to overlook them. And I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but it happens a lot. So it's my job as an investigator to step back, look at everything, present it to you, and let you make up your own mind. Listen, one thing I want to make clear is my job is not to convince any of you as to how I feel or what my opinion is. I don't care. I am just giving my opinion. I'm giving why I think certain things. And remember, it's always important, at least for me, to back up your opinions with why. I do not like when somebody says, Casey Anthony is guilty because she's a piece of shit. Okay, well, that may be true. But that doesn't back up why you feel that she's guilty. Now, if that's just your opinion, you want to say that, good. But you're, nobody with any sort of two cents is going to give that any credibility. However, if you say, well, Casey Anthony is guilty because of X, Y, and Z, then you get credibility. And at least then you'll get looked at and say, okay, well, I gave my best effort to explain why. Now, no matter what, people will still debate you because that's how they feel. They feel a certain way. They're in a certain camp and other people in a certain camp. 
Just like OJ, you have a ton of people. He's not guilty. He's not guilty. He's guilty. He's guilty. And very rarely are you going to get anybody to switch sides. And that's not my job. I'm not here to convince anybody. Darley Routier, I'm not here to convince you that she's guilty. I just said, in my opinion, based on this evidence, this evidence, and this evidence, and then you take the totality of all that evidence, in my mind, she's guilty. It's just my opinion. That's all it is. So, Tuesday, Ken's key clue in the Stephen Avery case. It is absolutely Teresa Hollabach's charred remains. And I'll get into why that is in tomorrow, Wednesday's deep dive. So, tune in Wednesday for the deep dive. Thursday, members, live session. We talk about the case. Throw your questions at me. And then Friday, I'll answer some of the non-members' questions and put out that video as well well thank you and until wednesday's deep dive hey you know what time it is mains out okay so it is wednesday's deep dive stephen avery brendan dossie making of a murderer making a murderer um you already listened to monday's solved or unsolved and tuesday's key clue so now's the deep dive if you want the backstory of this case instead of repeating it like I always do on Wednesday. I find that redundant for not only me, but for the other viewers that have already watched Monday and Tuesday. So if you're not familiar with this case, I would ask you to go back to Monday's Stephen Avery Solved or Unsolved and get familiarized with the case. Today, you know how I am. Jump right to the content. And that's what we're going to do. So before we do that, let me get a little bit more light here so you guys can see me. And we will rock and roll. Okay, so Teresa Hollabach's the victim, 25-year-old photographer. She's last seen going to Stephen Avery's residence. So what I want to start out with is the 1985 conviction of Stephen Avery for rape. No other way to put it than it was a tragedy. Is it a mistake? Sure, it's a mistake and mistakes do happen. However, it goes to illustrate how innocent people, without a doubt, are not only arrested, they are convicted. And I would venture to say some have been put to death for crimes they didn't commit. It's horrendous, but that's our justice system. Now, in this particular case, when I sit back and I, and I look at why he was arrested, he was known, Stephen Avery was known in this town, okay? Could you say troublemaker? I, I guess you could. I would be hesitant to, to say that. Um, arrest purposes, it looked like he had two. He had one very horrible crime of pouring gas on a cat and throwing it onto a fire. That's what I've read. Don't know the correct validity of that. In another article, I read that it was oil. Regardless, he admitted to it. Obviously, he minimized what he did by saying he was with a bunch of, you know, teens and, you know, friends and peer pressure and that. I get that. That's still awfully, awfully cruel. He did a burglary. The burglary was nothing, nothing big. You know, he took a sandwich, took some Slim Jims, whatever. Nothing major from this store. Yet... It goes to show, in my eyes, he certainly knows the right, the difference between right or wrong. And it, the consequences doesn't seem to bother him. When he runs afoul with his female cousin and she starts spreading, according to him, lies about him, um, in particular having sex in the front yard, 
in front of kids and other things, and he says this wasn't true. He, but what is true is that he seen her pass by his house. He got in. He chased her down. He ran her off of the road and pulled a rifle on her. Not a pistol, a rifle. And that is significant down the road, and I'll tell you why then. So, there's, there's those three incidents that happened prior to this 1985 sexual assault. The sexual assault happens, the female deputy who was friends with Stephen Avery's cousin, who he had run off the road, it's a small town. I, I, I don't find anything wrong with them being friends. Uh, she, the, the victim of this sexual assault from 1985 gives her description. This female deputy says, that sounds like Stephen Avery. They do a composite. Now the composite looks just like a mugshot of Stephen Avery. Just like it. When the sketch artist is, and he was a sheriff's deputy as well, is testifying at a deposition, very arrogant, very cocky, is the way he came off to me. Whether he lied or not, I'm not to judge that. But I will say that he made it sound like he was going strictly off of the description of the victim and he very well might be but it sure looked like the photograph of Stephen Avery lo and behold he's arrested okay he does 18 years DNA under the victim's fingernail whom she pointed out in a lineup that's him he did it DNA later exonerates him shows that a previous offender who has proclivity to sexual assaults, it was him. I believe his name was Gregory Allen. He was a suspect. His name was brought up more than once. Now what bothers me about this is not I shouldn't say not because Stephen Avery was arrested. I will say, in my opinion, there was not enough to arrest him. And he shouldn't have been arrested. Based off of just the victim's eyewitness testimony. Now why? It's not enough. Eyewitness testimony has been proven time and time again that it's not always reliable. You have to have more evidence than that. But I get where those cops were coming from back then. Back in 1985, eyewitness testimony, a lot different the way it was viewed compared to now. So, there was flaws in that investigation. I think tunnel vision would be appropriate. For what they had at that time but you try to look at both sides of the coin I look at the police officer side they have an eyewitness who was raped a survivor who picks him out of a lineup whether it was suggestive so again I get where the cops are coming from on this especially in 1985 but listen it it's not just a cop, okay, that has to make, or the, an investigator, to make the, the leap to arrest somebody. And by that I mean there's steps that has to go through, okay. A detective investigates, he says, hey, this is what I have. If he feels in his gut he's got the right person, he writes up an arrest warrant. Well, that ain't all that it that happens okay that arrest warrant 
has to be approved normally by his boss. So the detective boss has to read it, say, yep, we're good to go. Then it has to go to the district attorney who has to read it and say, yep, it's good to go. Then it has to go to a judge and the judge has to say, yep, there's probable cause, which means that a crime was committed, in this case, a sexual assault, and that more than likely, Stephen Avery committed it. Judge says, yes, there's enough probable cause here. So all those steps are taken. And then he's arrested, goes to jail. You got to remember, it takes all those steps. So it's not just the investigating officer's fault that this happened. Everybody else in line thought that he did it. And he didn't. That's the, so mistakes happen. Now, did they target him? I won't, I won't go there and say that. I would say that they thought they had their guy. And to me, more investigative work needed done before you can arrest somebody. I would have never arrested him. Now, I know you say, well, hindsight's always 2020. Well, in my, you know, 20 year career, I never arrested anybody I wasn't 100% sure. But that's me. That's the way I did things. A lot of people think differently. Hey, there's probable cause. That's not 100%. And it's not up to me. You know, this is what other detectives will say. There's probable cause there. It's up to a jury of his peers to find out whether he's guilty or not. That's what the jury systems were. I think differently because once you're arrested falsely, you're ruined. Whether you're convicted or not. If you're arrested for it, you're ruined for life. That's my opinion. So he does 18 years. Innocence Project gets involved and he they test DNA from underneath her fingernails. Lo and behold, it's a hit to Gregory Allen. Now the documentary wanted to make a big deal about while he was in jail, a detective, you have two different agencies involved. You have a sheriff's department and you have uh, a police. Much like in any case. A lot of times you have DA's investigators, you have police investigators. That's relevant in the Ramsey investigation and how they didn't see eye to eye. But in this case, while he's serving his 18 years, a police agency gets information that Gregory Allen confessed and said they're holding somebody else, arrested somebody else, somebody else is doing time for a sexual assault that he committed. That information gets to a detective. That detective calls the sheriff's department. The sheriff's department says, we already, we already got a guy. He passed it on to his detective and there was no follow-up done. Is that uncommon? No. Now the defense team wanted to make that a big deal. But it's not uncommon. That officer took the information and passed it on to who he felt was appropriate. And then it ended. In, in this case right here, this Gail Matthews case, you know how many hundreds, if not thousands, of tips come in and said, hey, you arrested the wrong guy. It was this person. And you know how many of those were followed up on? Almost all of them. But guess what? There was a couple that didn't get followed up on by me or other investigators. Whether because it was far-fetched or what it was, it just didn't get followed up on. When a report, a report should be done saying, hey, call received on this date, saying this, and it should be followed up on. In this case, it wasn't. Why? I can't answer that. I'm not there. I can just speak from my experience in law enforcement of how sometimes things get missed. Are you going to say it's shoddy police work? You'll probably, some will say that. Some that have never been there. But yes, it should have been done. 
I need coffee for this, I tell you. So, Stephen Avery gets out of jail. He gets out of jail, he sues the county. $36 million for wrongful imprisonment. Should he have done that? Sure. Sure. While the deposition's going on for this, Teresa Hollabach, the victim in this, gets a call from Stephen Avery, who uses a fake name and has her come out to take pictures of a van. She had been to his junkyard many times before, and she's never seen again. Again, this happens October 31st, uh, 2005. police follow up on it and they interview him and he says ah she was here she left now this starts the conflict of interest right away he becomes a person of interest why is it because he has a pending 36 million dollar lawsuit against the county or because that was the last place she was seen. I'm going to go with the latter and not the former. That's where the investigation has to begin. Is it coincidental that they have a he has a 36 million dollar lawsuit against them? Hey, what do you, what do you want the police to do? Hey, we, we can't we can't investigate because he has a lawsuit against us. No. They investigate. They did exactly what they should have done. Said, hey, this is a conflict of interest. We're gonna let an outside agency investigate this. Period. We're gonna appoint a special prosecutor. Period. They did that. They did all the right things. They implemented it, but they didn't follow through with it. And that's the problem. It's great to come up with these big plans. You know what? We are going to start a neighborhood um, beat. Our cops are going to walk the streets. They're going to interact with citizens, see how they're doing, get people to know them. Community policing. We're going to do this, and we, grow, we draw up this SOP, the Standard Operating Procedure. You know, it's 500 pages, and we're going to get the community to bite off on it, and we're going to pr promote it and do all these great things, and it's going to curb crime because people are going to trust the police, and they do it. They tell the police officers, this is what you're going to do. You're going to walk the beat for two hours each shift. And the police officers get it and say, yeah, we ain't doing that. And they don't. It works maybe for a week, and then they stop doing it. All great intentions. But if it's not implemented, it's worthless. That's what happened here, in my opinion. Because some days after Teresa went missing, They do a volunteer search on the junkyard. Remember, it's a 40-acre junkyard. And they do a search, and they're looking for Teresa or her green RAV4. And within 30 minutes in this 40-acre junkyard that has hundreds, if not thousands, of vehicles, as you can see by the aerial of it, they find it somewhat hidden like somebody was trying to disguise it when they shut off the junkyard and do a search the county which isn't supposed to be involved goes and helps on the search 
Big no-no. That's where the mistake was. So they find evidence, particularly a key to Teresa's car in Stephen Avery's bedroom. They hadn't found it in the first search, and they subsequently found it, and the person who found it was from the county. His name was uh, Mark, and they claim they, I hate when people always say, well, they say, well, who's they? At least the documentary and the defense say that this Mark planted the key. They find no blood in that bedroom. They find, well, before we get into the evidence, Stephen Avery's niece comes forward to a counselor and gives her suspicions of her cousin Brandon Dossey being involved in this because he had lost a bunch of weight. He was crying in a hallway during a birthday party. This is a 16 year old kid. And they, she asked him what's going on and he confesses that he saw a body in a fire pit that his uncle Stephen and him were attending. That place gets filled, or that information gets filtered to the police department. The investigators go and interview him. They go interview her. She recounts it. They go and interview him. When it comes to trial, she recounts or recants that information. She says, No, I didn't say that. She said she made it up. So, who do to believe? Well, I'll get into who I believe later on. Brandon Dossie is very low intelligence. I base this off of him talking and listening to the his word choices, his sentence structure, His movements, his rationale in decision making when I watch him. I would venture to say he's probably the worst that I've ever seen in regards to I hate to say IQ. He's just, he seems at 16 like a 10-year-old boy. That's what I would equate him to. He doesn't know what things mean, normal things, that a 16-year-old would know. He doesn't know what words mean. He doesn't know what implications mean. He confesses to a murder and ask his mom, will I be home tonight? You know, things like that. Not knowing what the word implication means. Um, I think of Jesse Miss Kelly, who is portrayed to have a very, very low IQ. This Brandon Dossie looks like Albert, or Jesse Miss Kelly looks like Albert Einstein compared to Brendan Dossie, in my opinion. That's how bad this kid is. <clears throat> so he's interviewed. Is there anything wrong with that? They interview him without his mother. Is there anything wrong with that? No, there's not. Especially if you ask permission. Now, hindsight again is always 20-20. Mom's saying, hey, they never asked me. Detectives say, yeah, we asked her. She said, go ahead. I guess it's who you believe. 
The confession of Brandon Dossie is coupled with everybody that believes Stephen Avery is innocent because of his previous conviction where he did not do it. So now people are going to say, well, you have a very low, very low IQ individual and the police, if you watch that confession, are interrogating him and making him give a false confession. Do I believe that? Now, when I looked at Jesse Miss Kelly, I believed it because of the way the detectives were giving him information. Do I believe that in this case? No, I do not. The confession in this case, now there's already people that stopped watching just because I said that, right? Because there's two camps. And you can't convince other and I'm I'm not here to convince. It's just my opinion. When I watched the confession, now they interviewed him, they got him out of school. Anything wrong with take going to school and getting him out? No. They interview him there, he gives a little bit. Call the prosecutor, the and the district attorney, and he says, Hey, we want a more formal one. Get him down to the station, get it on tape. Anything wrong with that? No. That's good police work. That's working the case backwards. You know what you're going to need at trial. You're going to need this on audio. You're going to need this on video. So bring them down there. I've done that. You start the interview at somebody's house. It's kind of informal. You're trying to get information. Hey, and all of a sudden they give something big. Ooh, okay. I need you to come down to the station. We're going to record this. There's nothing wrong with that. They bring him down. He gives a little bit more. He takes a little bit less. This kid cannot talk more than one sentence in these environments. Very slow, very, he's not talking, okay? He's just, he, he's, he's like this. Yes, no, I don't remember. What are you supposed to do in that instance? He's got information. You just got information from him that he has information. And now he's kind of closing up. Well, you, are you supposed to say, hey, he's of low IQ. We're not going to talk to him. No. You have to get that information from him. Okay. That's exactly what these investigators are doing. It's like pulling teeth to get information from him. But that's the investigator's job. That's what they get paid for. They're not, they're not making him confess. They're not beating him up. Are they leading him on by giving him... I didn't see a lot of that. I seen one instance, in my opinion, where they maxed up. Hey, but I'm, no, I'm not an expert. It's just my opinion. And that was when they said, what happened with her head? What happened with her head, Brandon? And he, I don't know, I don't know. I don't think he did know. He doesn't know what they mean. Then finally the investigator said, well, who shot her in the head? Yes. In my opinion, that was a mistake. That's one thing that the public didn't know about and it should have been kept but I understand what he was trying to do he was trying to get a confession with that information he wanted Brandon Dossie to know we know and when he got frustrated that Brandon wasn't biting he gave him the information I'm sure that investigator probably looks back now and regrets that he did that. Maybe not. You know, he had to try something different. It wasn't working. The guy was not giving the information up. And they knew that he had information. Everybody can sit back with their 2020 vision on and say, 
oh, you can't be talking to people like that. You, you're feeding them information. That's because you've never been in that situation. He wasn't. It wasn't a... I'm not going to say it wasn't a false confession. I'm going to say they were not coercing him to make a false confession. Now, in Brandon's mind, did he feel, hey, I got to say what they want me to say so I can get out of here? No. You know why I don't believe that? Because I don't think he's smart enough to know that. You know what I mean? I think, in my opinion, more than likely, Brandon's confession, although minimized, had elements of truth to it. What I don't like about the confession that disturbs me is how Brandon readily admits to raping her. To me, that shows a person who is not very bright and not bright enough to think if I tell these guys what they want to hear, they'll let me go. Initially, I found it very hard to believe Brandon's confession. And that is, Brandon says, hey, I get off the school bus. Now, his confession changed a couple of times. Timelines, stuff like that. But one of the, the confessions is, hey, I get off the school bus. He had, I got the mail. My Uncle Stephen had a piece of mail. I start walking towards his trailer. I hear a woman screaming. I go in. Knock on the door. He answers all sweaty. Tells me to come in. Shows me Teresa shackled. Arms and legs to his bed. Stephen tells him to rape her. She does. He does. I found that hard to believe. But when I looked at Brandon and his IQ... it became clearer to me that this guy is easy, easily influenced. Takes you back to the confession, right? If he's easily influenced, maybe the confession is false. Maybe. Maybe he was coerced into that. Maybe. But some of the things that he said during the confession, like Teresa saying, you don't have to do this, make him stop, those things had a ring of truth to it to me. Now Brandon says after he was done raping her he did not ejaculate. Um, Stephen had already raped her although he did not witness it. He slashed her throat or stabbed her in the stomach and Stephen slashed her throat. Stephen carried her out into a garage. Now see, and this is where part of the confessions he starts to waver on. They're trying to pressure him into saying where, why did you go out to the garage and where was her car? He doesn't know, he doesn't know. It eventually comes and he says the car, her RAV4 was backed into the garage and Stephen had loaded her body up in that after he shot her in the garage five times. He heard five shots. So then when they go and they get this information from Brandon, they say Brandon says we put the body of Teresa in the back of her car. He changes his mind, pulls her out, and they burn her in a fire pit. That's important. The fire the bonfire because in every one of Brandon's confessions 
He admits that there was a bonfire. Now, this is not unusual, apparently, for Steve and Avery. They have bonfires. People saw this bonfire. And Teresa Hollabach was put in that bonfire. Brennan's confession gets a search warrant started at the residence. Now they're looking for particular things. What would I be looking for now after Brandon's confession? So you get a confession. Let's say you had already searched Avery residence. You found the car there earlier. Volunteers found that. I am looking for blood. In particular, I want everything in that bedroom. Luminol, sheets, blood spatter. You're looking for a gun now because he confessed to a shot or being shot. All these things now that you go back. Now, it was allegedly an eight-day search. The defense and the pro-Avery side want to say that that was extremely long. Gave time to plant evidence. Do you need eight days to plant evidence? You can plant evidence in 30 seconds. Okay, they, the reason it was eight days is because they wanted to be meticulous. Okay, that's all that, that was. It, to me, they were trying to do everything right. Now, whether they did or not, I'll, I'll let you know. Now, what I find interesting is in the bedroom where this murder allegedly took place, at least the sexual assault occurred there, they find no blood. But they do find blood in the garage where it was cleaned up. They found jeans that Brandon were, was wearing that night because he confessed to where those jeans were that had blood on them. Now, I think the blood was washed up and too degraded for DNA. But in that garage, they find a spent casing, or not the casing, the actual bullet. A single bullet that had Teresa Hollabach's DNA on it. Kind of corroborating exactly what Brandon Dossi said that she was killed in the garage. Again, investigators... jumped the gun there and telling him that she was shot in the head. How did they know she was shot in the head? Well, during this eight-day search, they find Teresa Hollabach. They find her bones, charred remains, in a, the fire pit. Just like the investigators or the confession said, So, now let's look at the evidence. You have Teresa Hollbach's RAV4. Big piece of evidence. Found on the junkyard. Looks like it's trying to be hidden. H hastily. Old car hood leaned up against it. Tree branches covering it. License plate removed. Inside that RAV4, they find... Teresa Hollabach's blood in the back area, just like the confession said, they, she was placed in there and then pulled out. But they also find Stephen Avery's blood. Blood that the defense says was planted. The key, it was found in a couple different places, but the key to me was it was found right where the key ignition is where you would start the key, You'd start the vehicle. Stephen Avery had a cut on his finger, on his right hand, the exact location where that would be. Now one of the dramatic incidents on the documentary 
is when police, or not police, defense attorneys, go and look at the evidence from the 1985 conviction for rape of Stephen Avery, where they drew blood from him. They find it, they see that it had been cut open, because when you have a piece of evidence, okay, you seal it with evidence tape, and then you sign your name and you date it. When that is ripped open, you reseal it. So you can count, and there's a chain of custody, and you can see how many times it was opened. In this case, it was the evidence tape was ripped open, and there was a piece of scotch tape holding it back together. Is that unusual? No. I've seen that happen hundreds of times. Evidence tape isn't available, especially in cases that have already been gone through the system, person is found guilty, whatever, piece of scotch tape to hold it together. Not unusual. When they open that, they find a tube of not coagulated blood of Stephen Avery, but liquid blood, which means uh, it's not, it's, it's preserved, okay, which means there should be a chemical in that that preserves that blood. They find a hypodermic needle hole in the top of that tube. And the defense goes crazy. He says, this is a banner day for the defense. Because this proves that somebody went in there, extracted Stephen Avery's blood, and went and planted it. Now, when I watched it, my opinion was interesting. Because he says... We called the lab corps who had tested the blood, and they say that is not how they take the blood out. Well, if the documentary would have researched further, they would find that those tubes are pressurized, and that is exactly how they, how they preserve the blood. And there was nothing wrong, and that needle mark was not a big discovery. But... For this documentary crew, they sure made it look like it was planting of blood. Now, the preservative, I believe, and we talked about this in the O.J. Simpson case, the, what is it, EDTA? Um, and, and they brought in the FBI to test the blood in Teresa Hollebach's vehicle to determine whether that preservative was present. Because if it's present in the blood, one would assume that the blood was planted. They did not find that. Now, does that alone prove the blood wasn't planted? No, no, it doesn't. Do I believe the blood was planted? No. And I'm going to get into the planting of the evidence. Stephen Avery and Brandon Dossey go to trial on this. They are both found guilty by a jury of their peers. Was it the right decision? Well, let's get into it. Let's get into some things that I wrote down that may have bothered me or bothered somebody else, and we'll try to answer them. First thing is the finding of Teresa Hollebach's car in this 40 acre junkyard with hundreds if not thousands of other cars and they find it within 30 to 35 minutes the pro avery side wants to say that that proves that they knew it was there and that car was planted i think that that is ludicrous why can't it be which is exactly what it is that they started their search in that area and came upon it 
It's that simple. Think of it the other way. What if they started on the other end of the junkyard and it took them nine hours to find it? Do you think pro Avery people would say, well, it took them nine hours to find it. That gave them plenty of time to go get it and plant it. Yes, they would. Okay. They found it quickly. Good. That doesn't prove anything, especially a conspiracy. Eight-day search. Well, that's entirely too long for a search warrant. No, it's not. When you're being meticulous, when you're trying to do everything right, and you have a lot of space to cover, I have no problem with that. The conflict of interest. This is where they screwed up. They thought they were doing everything right, and they had, like I said, made the attempt, but they didn't do it. The county should not have been there to help. They should have just excused themselves, period. Would it have taken away this conspiracy? No. No, conspiracy theorists and pro-Avery people would say, hey, those are the county's buddies that are doing it. The special prosecutor. I've seen it happen a lot. I've seen my district attorney that I worked for do that. He had come to me on a couple of things and asked my opinion. What do you think? Should we prosecute this? Should we farm it out to the attorney general's office? Hey, anytime there's a conflict of interest, your best case, farm it out. They did that. Ken Krantz. Now, they want to bring up his demons about him sexting a domestic violence girl. No relevance. No relevance to this case. All that is, is people throwing stones. Is that a moral and ethical problem? Sure. That's his problem. That has nothing to do with Stephen Avery. Okay? Why they bring those things up just to create doubt. Just to add other things for a conspiracy. Has nothing to do with this. The planning of evidence. Does it happen? Yes. I would be naive. I would be a fool to say that it doesn't happen. Did it happen in this case? My personal opinion, again, is no. It didn't happen. Now, what do I base that on? I don't know these guys. People will say, and I will say, they had 36 million reasons to plan evidence. Right? That's how much the county was getting sued for from Stephen Avery. So they plant the evidence so they don't have to pay the money. Right? Wrong. Those police officers don't care. They don't care about the county. That ain't their money. It ain't coming from them. I'm not going to jeopardize my career and my reputation and my integrity by planning evidence so the county drops a lawsuit that's ridiculous now could they do it as a personal vendetta against Stephen Avery sure sure they could did any of them have a personal vendetta against Stephen Avery well people will say yeah Avery made them look bad. Maybe. Maybe. I would have to know more about those police officers. But from what I saw, I saw nothing that would indicate that they planted evidence. So what? That they missed that key the first time. I've missed things in search warrants plenty of times. And then we caught... I had a drug case. The informant was in there. I gave her money. She came back out. Gave me the drugs. Hey, he has 
He just he was cooking up the crack. Why was in there? He showed he was bagging it up. It's it's in there. I get the search warrant. I'm back there within 15, 20 minutes to search that house, and I can't find it anywhere. Anywhere. The informant who I trusted, who had done many other buys, controlled buys for me, said, Hey, it's in there. I had to get a second search warrant to look. I found the money. In a common hallway was a trash can. And in that trash can, underneath the liner, was the crack. Did I plant that? No! I just missed it! So do I get bent out of shape about this key being missed? No, I don't. If you wanted to plant evidence, you would make it, for example, they found in the search warrant leg shackles. What's that remind you of? Brandon Dossie's confession. So leg shackles were found. Maybe if they wanted to plant something, why not plant those shackles and put them on the bed? Wouldn't that corroborate the confession even more so than just the key? You get those shackles, put Stephen Avery's blood on it, right? The key fob was tested and it showed Stephen Avery's DNA. Only his, not Teresa's. Now, the defense will say that's impossible. That's impossible. It upsets me because they don't know the realities. Or maybe they do know the realities. They have to know the realities because they're attorneys. And attorneys, for the most part, have to be smart. It is just like this coffee mug. The defense will say, hey, listen, we tested Teresa Hollabach's vehicle. Stephen Avery's fingerprints weren't in it. But his blood's in it. That proves that the blood was planted. Well, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It's just because I touch this doesn't mean my fingerprints are on it. You're not always leaving fingerprints. You're not always. So you can't say that. When I first went to Layton Print School, which is how to develop Layton fingerprints, I was assigned to fingerprint our evidence room. Our fingerprint guy had been on a medical leave for months. So everything that negative fingerprint got backed up. For two weeks, I fingerprinted stuff, and I'm fresh out of school. There is drug baggies with coke in it, money, all sorts of things, digital scales, that I know the drug dealer touched. I fingerprint it. I don't come up with any latent prints. What's that tell you? You don't always leave a fingerprint. It isn't that something was planted. But the defense, it's their job to place reasonable doubt in this. In all their cases. This leads us... Okay, before I say the, the big key piece of evidence... Back to the key fob. So, Stephen Avery's DNA is found on that. How did police get his DNA on that? It wasn't blood. It wasn't semen. It's skin cells. They can't plant that. So why is Teresa's DNA not on there? No idea. No idea. But that doesn't mean that it was planted. Brandon Dossie also confessed that Stephen Avery got under the hood of Teresa's RAV4 and disconnected the battery. Lo and behold, Stephen Avery's DNA is found on that hood latch. Again, not, not blood. Not semen, 
not saliva. So what's that tell you? Which leads me to the biggest piece of evidence. Teresa Hollabach's remains. Found in a burn pit. Some of them found in a barrel, a burn barrel, with her belongings on the Stephen Avery property. This case reminded me, at least this aspect of the case, of Lena Chapman, Lena Chapin, from Netflix Unsolved Mysteries, where the mother had killed her husband, burned his body, and then put the body in buckets. Then her and her daughter drove down the road, reaching in those buckets and dispersing the ashes. Now I went and met with the daughter, the other daughter, of that Netflix show and she told me how her sister who ended up going missing and is presumed killed by her mother how the ashes and the bones were still hot and it would burn her hands when she was throwing it out the window this is what happened here the body was placed in this burn pit with tires which burn hot and other pieces of junk burning kept going for a long period of time then the bones crushed up with you know a shovel a rake and then when it's cool you go and you disperse some of the bones that's what happened here people lose sight of the big picture explain to me if Stephen Avery is innocent, how those bones, how Teresa Hollenbach's body got found feet from his trailer in a burn pit. There are some wild claims out there, and that's what they are, wild. You have James Cameron, who stated... Eddie Edwards blew up Teresa Hollenbach's body, picked up the pieces, burned them, and then framed Stephen Avery. That's the most asinine and ludicrous thing I've ever heard in my life. There are others who basically say the same thing. Someone else killed her, burned her, and then took the bones over in that fire pit to frame him. That, too, is almost as asinine as Eddie Edwards blowing her up, but not quite. But it's still ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And the people that believe that ought to have their head examined. Now, why? Why do I say that? If you wanted to plant evidence, in this particular case, a body to frame somebody, would it not be easier to take the victim's remains whole and place them on the property, place it in the RAV4 to be found, but yet you're gonna take the time to burn the body beyond recognition so you there's just bones and fragments of bones to delay identification because you want to frame somebody think about that that is why evidence was not planted I 
I have written down here, you have to look at Stephen Avery's proclivity. I don't see the proclivity for sexual assault. Although there was information from inmates who said that he wanted to create a torture chamber to rape women, I don't know the validity of that. I did see letters that he wrote home to his first wife which were not very nice, saying he wanted to kill her and he would kill things like that. People want to bring up if it was really Stephen Avery, there was a car crusher there. Why didn't he crush the RAV4? I don't know the answer to that. But that doesn't prove that the RAV4 was planted maybe he was going to crush it he just didn't get time to crush it could it be that simple why does everything have to be a conspiracy whenever there's questions you will always have questions no case is cut and dry but just because there's questions doesn't mean that you have to input conspiracies what else would I like to cover before I end this do I think now in the second season I guess this high profile attorney who I've never met uh, wanted to come out and say that Bobby Dassey is the murderer Again, that's just a defense attorney doing everything that they can do for, to get their client off. I see no validity to it. For sure, I believe somebody that not only had access, but I say lived on that property killed Teresa Hallbach. Much like John Benet Ramsey. You watch that video. I say, hey, I can't say who did it. I will tell you it was somebody from inside that house because of X, Y, and Z. But I can't go any further than that. And I'm not going to speculate and make a guess because I'm not going to make an ass out of myself. That's what fools do. And I'm not no fool. But in this case, I take the totality of of everything because I do not believe that the evidence was planted therefore I can opine that because the key fob was found in Stephen Avery's bedroom because of Brandon Dossie's confession because the remains were found right out his door which speaks volume let's say everything else was planted Let's just say, for shits and giggles, everything else was planted. He would have to be involved because of those remains being found right there. What? He's uh, Somebody's going to start a big bonfire right by his trailer and the smell of dead flesh coming in through his windows and every time he opens that door and he's not going to notice anything? And if somebody was, wouldn't he say... Hey, I was sleeping. I come out, there's a big bonfire going on. And I don't know who started it. He never said that. He, in fact, he said he started the bonfire. And the reason he started that was to dispose of Teresa Hollabach's body. There's other things that I know that I have missed because this is a very convoluted case but when you take out all the noise all the reasonable doubt that the defense is trying to throw in there that has nothing to do with anything and focus on the evidence once you get past that preconceived notion that the evidence was planted once you get past that, 
the case becomes cut and dry that Stephen Avery committed this murder. Now, Brennan Dossie, his involvement is something I struggle with because I can't get a good enough read and there's no evidence against Brandon Dossie except for his own admission. Therefore, I cannot say what Brandon Dossie's involvement was. I will leave that opinion out of it and focus on Stephen Avery. It's possible Brendan Dossey didn't do anything but witness it. It could be the only thing he did witness was the body in the fire. That could be his involvement. That simple. That's the lowest I'll go with him. I believe he knows something and it could be as simple as him only seeing the body. Do I believe that he raped her? I will not go there. There's no evidence of that. Did he witness what he says he witnessed and drew a picture of? Of Teresa being shackled to the bed. Handcuffed to the bed, shackled to the bed. I would expect to see, if that was the case, on that headboard, a lot of cuts, a lot of abrasions from her struggling. And I don't believe they found that. Although they did find the shackles. I will not say for sure. In addition of no blood being found in there. I'm sure that if it did happen in there and she was stabbed, there would be blood evidence in there. Not necessarily blood spatter. You're not going to find blood spatter from somebody getting stabbed unless it's repeatedly or their throat cut. You will get high velocity spatter if you shoot somebody. They did not find that in the garage either. Although they did find the spent, not the spent, the bullet with Teresa Hollabox DNA. Now, people will say that that was planted. I don't know how you plant that with Teresa Hollabox DNA. If she was stabbed in that bed, all that bedding is burned. So you wouldn't find any evidence of that. What I, again, what I would expect to find is some sort of abrasions to that bed where she was cuffed to. Again, do I believe Brandon Dossie's confession? Not necessarily. I do not believe it was coerced, though. Some of the things that he said just did not make sense. But I do believe he witnessed something. If I was on the jury, I would have convicted Stephen Avery. I would not have convicted Brandon Dossie. From the evidence that I saw, which was minimal. That's my opinion on this case. It is hard for people to believe there's always two sides. Very rarely do you have an unbiased mind. I try very hard to be unbiased. That's why I don't read people's comments and I don't want to know what people's thoughts are before I do my own research. Now, you may say, well, inherently you are biased because you were a law enforcement officer. Maybe that's true. I would disagree with that assessment. 
I think that I am very unbiased. I just think I know I can put myself in those officers and investigators' shoes a lot of times. Therefore, it gives me a unique perspective to speak on both sides of the fence. Now, if police jack it up, I'll say it. You know, I've said it before in many different cases. I don't always agree with the police. West Memphis 3 is a good example. Although Damian Eccles and uh, Jesse Miss Kelly and Jason Baldwin may have done it. I just didn't see the evidence there. I didn't see it. In this case, I just do not believe there was planning of evidence. I think you can make a conspiracy theory out of anything. I just don't see it. The evidence points to Stephen Avery. And you're going to say, well, he was wrongfully convicted before. Therefore, he's being wrongfully convicted again. I feel bad for their family. I see the hurt in her but it's the family sticking up. I go back to Stephen Avery's, Avery's niece who got the ball rolling, really, on this by saying Brandon Dossie was crying, lost a lot of weight. He explained it as he was trying to lose weight because he had lost his girlfriend. I don't believe that for a minute. Not a minute. Uh, she later testifies that she made that all up. And she was crying on the stand and I felt horrible for her. But did she really make that up? Or was she protecting a family member now? I think she was protecting a family member. There's very few cases that I've seen where a family member says, especially a mom or dad, they did it. He did it. No. None of them want to believe Number one, that their loved one could commit a heinous act. Number two, even if they do believe it, they're going to stick by them. That's what families do. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But you can't go off of just because Stephen Avery's dad gets all mad and the mom cries and says that their son is being railroaded. Just because they say that, doesn't mean you should believe it. They should say that. And I got no problem with them saying that. But do I believe it? Was Stephen Avery railroaded? No, not in my opinion. I'm not afraid to take that stance because that's what I see. It's very important not to jump on bandwagons, at least for me. That's how I live my life. Just because everybody wants to say, hey, it's this. I'll say it's that if I believe it after I look at everything. I think I was accused at one point in time of being a Hollywood elite. <laughs> Just because, you know, I've been on TV and did a couple TV shows uh, because I believed the West Memphis 3 case. You know, Johnny Depp, Eddie Vedder, and Natalie Maines, they all jump on board and said that Damian Eccles and Baldwin and Miss Kelly didn't do it. And I, because I said, it looks to me that there was not enough evidence to convict them, and therefore I think you ought to look somewhere else that I'm accused of jumping on the bandwagon. That's not what I'm doing, that's what I saw. I don't jump on bandwagons. If that was the case, I would jump on the bandwagon that everybody says the cops railroaded Stephen Avery and Brendan Dossie. I won't jump on that because that's not what I see. That's not what the evidence tells me. That's not what victimology, suspectology, timeline, evidence, the biggest piece of evidence, the body being there, and because I don't believe in outrageous conspiracies, Stephen Avery, in my opinion, is where he belongs. And every appeal that he's had has been denied. Why do you think that is? I think you have the answer to that.
So, hey, that's the end of the Stephen Avery deep dive. Um, you know, we'll talk more about it tomorrow on the live. And I'll answer your questions and comments Friday on that video. So, take out all the noise. Look at the evidence. What does it tell you? Stephen Avery, guilty of the murder of Teresa Hollenbach, as always. Thoughts and prayers, condolences for the victim. It's always the most important person. People want to overlook that and make it about Stephen Avery when it's not. It shouldn't even be called the Stephen Avery case. It should be called the Teresa Hollenbach case. She's the one who is the victim here. Never forget that. So, hey, you know what's next. Maine's out. All right, so today I'm here to talk about convicting a murderer. Now, what this is, is basically, from what I gather, a retort of the show Making a Murderer. I don't have to go into Making a Murderer because everybody that's watching this already knows about that show. So, uh, I was sent an advanced copy of Convicting a Murderer, meaning it's not released to the public yet. I believe the release date is in a few weeks, September something. But the Daily Wire, which is, I guess, distributing this or producing it, and Candace Owens is the host and producer of it as well. Anyway, they sent me um, an email asking if I would take an advanced look at it and give them their or give them my opinion on it. Um, was a little reluctant because I did not get into the whole making of a murderer frenzy, meaning I looked at it for this channel. Um, I did watch the show. But I just, I didn't get enamored with it like a lot of people do. With that said, you know, I, I didn't lie one way or another when I went into walking, watching Making of a Murderer. So when these, the publicist from the Daily Wire reached out to me and said, hey, would you review this? Let us know what you think, so on and so forth. Yeah, sure, I'll do it. Uh... I guess there was a big deal about the producer, Candace Owens. I have no idea who that is. Um, I do now. Just like the Daily Wire, I didn't know who that was either. But I do now because when people send me things and ask me to endorse this or take a look at it, whatever it is, whether it's a case somebody sends me, I review it. Hey, is there credibility here? Who are these people? So that's what I did. And, you know, some of the things I found out was kind of shocking. And what I mean by that is I took a little, I wrote a little post for Twitter. And I'm not a big social media per person as you know it. Right now for Facebook, I am putting out a lot of extra content, but there's a reason for that. But I don't get into Twitter or Instagram that much. But I do promote my show. But Twitter is like a whole different animal. I mean, so I posted a little blurb about, hey, uh, I got an advanced copy of this from Candace Owen, The Daily Wire, and I look forward to watching it. Um, I look forward to watching a true crime show that's not misleading. That's all I put. There's a lot of true crime shows out there that are biased. And... And I don't usually look at comments. As you know, I don't like comments. That's why they're turned off here on YouTube. But you can't turn them off on uh, Twitter, as far as I know. But all the replies, you know, I jumped back on there and looked, and they were all real hateful, all real negative. You know, boy, what kind of detective are you? You call yourself a detective? Another person says you're on the lowest rung of the ladder with Candace Owens and you're just trying to make a name for yourself. I was like, now I see why I turn off comments and don't use social media. 
and then somebody else who's making a, a political thing. Because I guess Candace Owens is known for her public or political views of some sort. And I don't know. I don't care about any of that. So it, it, it is obvious to me, it sure seems to me, that the making of a murderer and Stephen Avery and how your stance is on that, that somehow is political. I don't understand it. But it seems like if you believe that Stephen Avery is guilty, you are supposed to be a Republican. And if you believe he was framed and he's innocent, you're a Democrat. I, I don't get that. The people that make this leap or, or put it in those categories are out of their mind. Anyway, I looked at making of a murder. I watched it. I took notes. Uh, but then I got police reports. I started looking through it. It was very evident to me, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Stephen Avery was guilty of the murder of Teresa Halbach. Is that Halbach? I believe is her last name. Now, when I, when I did my videos, giving my reasons, it was the first time that I encountered real hate in my comment section. This is before I got smart and turned off my comments. Um, up until that time, all the videos, you would have one or two supporters that would say, even Dorley, Dorley Routier had some supporters. It wasn't a lot of hate. But there were some. But my goodness, with this Stephen Avery case, I've never seen anything like it. I went to bed, woke up, got on my YouTube to see how the views were, and I seen there was thousands of comments, and over half of them were hatred towards me for my opinion, for my beliefs, at looking at the facts. And it's like they were accusing me of being political, which boggles my mind. It really does. I'm going to link at the end of this um, my video for, I did a whole week's worth of videos on Stephen Avery. Uh, but I'll, I'll link a, dink, a deep dive or something to this so you can look. Um, it, it's evident. If you just use common sense. Now, again, this was my first voyage into hate in YouTube. Now, I've experienced conspiracy theorists in other cases. But not... Not hate plus conspiracy. And that was all in this case. So, naturally, I wanted nothing to do with it. Hey, I stated my opinion. Stephen Avery is guilty because X, Y, and Z. It's always important to state why. And then I moved on. Lost a lot of subscribers because people were sending me comments and emails. I'm unsubbing from you. Like, I give a shit. You know, I don't do this for subscriptions or people out there just are absolutely crazy. But I gone away for it for almost a year, it seems like. So, again, this is why I was hesitant to do this. But because I thought, hey, look, I looked at it with a non-biased eye, no matter what some of you idiots will claim, but I, he was guilty. The evidence showed me that he was guilty. Now, you can take those facts and those evidence and twist it any way you want to make him look like he's innocent, and that's fine. Have your opinion. But I was like, yeah, I'll look at this. I have no idea who Candace Owens is. I don't know what her political views are, and I don't care. I don't know who the Daily Wire is, and I don't know their political views, and I don't care. It's about the truth. 
The media, filmmakers included, can manipulate things to have it just like defense and prosecution does. More so the defense. Um, they manipulate things to create reasonable doubt. Now, in this making of a murderer, I knew when I watched it, they were biased, without a doubt. And that's why it's important to look at cases from a non-biased lens. They were biased towards his innocence and in that he was framed because of A, B, and C. I look beyond that. Okay? Listen. You can point out any little thing. Any little piece of evidence. And conspiracy theorists do. It comes down to common sense. Okay? Last scene there. Suspect changes his mind numerous times. His statements as to when he saw her. Her body, her remains, were found in a burn pit next <laughs> on the property. So was the vehicle. It's common sense. So what conspiracy theorists want to do is they'll take every little thing. Okay, the car. The car being found there. Wow, she couldn't have found it in 10 minutes or whatever it is. Yes, she could. Okay, it's the same thing people do with Billy the Kid. Pat Garrett couldn't have known, you know, that he was going to be there. It was an ambush and he actually let him go. No. No. You're complicating things. And more so, you're not just complicating things. You're, in your mind, you're making excuses for why things happen. And you don't have to. They just happen. Because they're common sense. For example... Her car being found. Well, there's no way. A 40-acre property, 3,000 vehicles there. How did they find that in 10 minutes? Well, maybe they just started in that area. No, it couldn't be. It has to be a conspiracy. Police planted it there. The remains. Although oh, well, the police somehow, you know, they found remains in this barrel and this one over here and all the way over here. So... It can't be that Stephen Avery or somebody on that property did it. It's got to be the police. Oh my God, if you really believe that. If you believe that. That's like Eddie Edwards, you know, and somebody blowing up Teresa Hallback's body, picking up the pieces, and then taking them over to Stephen Avery's and burning them. That... that that is enough to make me lose my mind. Because if you believe that, if you believe a police officer killed Teresa Hallbaugh and then took her car, took her body over to the Avery property and burned them, burned the remains without anybody knowing or burn the remains at their place. Because somebody will say that. Well, he didn't burn them there. They burned them at the police officer's place. And then scooped the remains up and took them over to Stephen Avery's place. To frame him for an insurance money that they don't are not on the hook for. As I said before, uh, or this lawsuit, the insurance pays that. The county's insured. It ain't coming out of the police officer's pocket. They don't care. If you believe that, I, I, I don't know what to say about you. That's great. How about that? I'll say that. That's great. I'm glad you believe that. And you can put that opinion that you have anywhere you want because Twitter is crazy land. So you put that out there and other inhabitants of crazy land will cling to it and it'll build and it'll fester like a like an ant colony and it'll keep getting bigger but it doesn't change the facts and rational people can see right through it and say Stephen Avery's he's guilty so keep going on Twitter keep bashing me for my beliefs 
uh, that's fine. You know what I mean? You'll never get a response from me. So, and I just find that so crazy that people like to leave like hateful comments knowing that they're not going to get a, a response, but yet it, it builds off of that comment and other people will be like, yeah, he's just looking for a name for what name am I looking for? <laughs> Uh, anyhow, so let me get to my review of this. I cannot release any spoilers. I can just say that it was very well done, just like making the a murderer. I thought it was well done, although I, you know, obviously seeing it was it was biased and they left out certain things or twisted certain facts. But whatever. Every documentary I've ever watched pretty much does that. Especially true crime. One way or another. So it's not like I hold the filmmakers like in a, a vat of hate. You know. I Hey, I don't care. They did their thing. It, it is kind of dangerous because look at what it's done. It's created this whole subsection of people that really believe every single thing that you put out there, but that's that's the media. That's why the media has always been so dangerous because that's what goes to the masses. Like Jim Morrison said, you control the media, you control people's minds because that's what they listen to. But I just encourage you to do your own research. Now, some of you conspiracy theorists are gonna say, well, I did. Listen, you. You'll never change these people's minds. So you don't even try. I don't try. You know, people sent me emails. Well, why don't you come and debate? I don't debate. Because no matter what I bring up, you counter it. I've seen it a million times in court. Okay? So the, no one ever wins. I learned my lesson about responding to comments on social media a long time ago probably 10 years ago, and that's when I stopped responding to comments. Um, you can't win. You come back with this great retort, and you think, huh, I got the best of them, and the next thing you know, they respond to something, and then you respond, and it just goes on, and nobody ever wins, right? And so, like, a weaker person will feel better about themselves because they're like, oh, I got them on that one. Listen, the best response is no response, okay? You will never change an opinion of a conspiracy theorist. Just like you probably would never change a, a, an opinion of somebody that believes the opposite. It just takes a strong person to be like, you know what? You got a good point there. Um, that's the way you have to be. But I, I'm not debating. This is what I saw. Okay, so uh, watching this certainly didn't change my mind. My mind was made up when I watched the show. They didn't frame Stephen Avery. He's guilty, trying to pull the wool over your eyes. The documentary kind of did that, but Stephen Avery did that too. Uh, he's not unlike 100,000 other criminals that are out there that have gotten caught. There's people that believe that they didn't do it. Vince Doan is a perfect example. Kerry Culberson case. Okay. He's reached out to me because he's watched my videos. And he said, you're wrong. I didn't do this. Jennifer Hill case. Go back in my library and watch my eight episodes of that. Kim Hubbard killed her. He's convicted. I meet with him. I didn't do this. Yes, you did. Because of X, Y, and Z. It ain't just because you were convicted. There's been innocent people convicted in this country for hundreds of years. Even put to death and they were innocent. I know that. I've seen it. Stephen Avery isn't one of them. He's guilty, in my opinion. I mean, it's not like I'm the only person that have, has thought that or sees it. Didn't... A jury convict him? Same with Kim Hubbard, the Jennifer Hill case. P 
people wanted to throw shade at me. Tell me, you know, I'm a bad person because I say he's guilty. I didn't convict him. You know, the jury already did that. I just looked at the facts and I happened to agree. I don't always agree, but on at least those two cases, I agree. So you want to throw dirty looks somewhere, throw them in a mirror. Not at me. But again, I don't, I don't care. Everyone, you know, they act like I have a stake in this game. Like, I, I guess I'm, I'm not as invested as some of, like, the Avery supporters. Or even the Ave people that are against Avery. I'm neither. I could care less about the guy. I, 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 he could come right here, sit here right beside me. I'd shake his hand, talk to him respectfully. I have no problem with him. But I know he committed the murder. That's all. That's all that I looked at. I looked at the facts. And there wasn't very many facts I have to look at. And that's another thing. You, conspiracy theorists go down all these rabbit holes when you don't have to. It's much simpler. Sure, if you, you could take a blood sample and all of a sudden break that down into a million whys as to why it's not relevant. When it is. You can do that with anything to make a person look innocent or have something that you feel doesn't make sense in your eyes. That's okay. It's your brain, the way your brain operates. But I guess my advice would be step back. Look at it through logical eyes. And sometimes that's very difficult because things in our past have shaped the way we see things. So you might see things already through a tainted lens. Maybe the cops pulled you over and gave you a ticket when they said you were speeding and you know damn well you weren't. So you're jaded already. So now when you look at the case, you're like, he's framed. They did it to me. S step back and take away that veil of taintness and, and look at it through a logical and non-biased eye. If you do that, and I've done that with hundreds, if not thousands of cases. It shows Stephen Avery is guilty. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Listen, I understand people have different opinions. And that's okay. Not everybody has to agree. And I'm not asking anybody. I'm not asking anybody to agree with me. As a matter of fact... I'm not asking you for anything. You can blow up my Twitter page, Facebook page, Instagram page with all your hate. It doesn't change anything. I'm not, I'm not asking you to stop that. I'm not asking you to stop believing that Stephen Avery is innocent. It's not my job to convince you. I don't care what you think. Do what you do. I'm just giving my opinion. Just like you're giving your opinion. You know? It's as simple as that. So, Convicting a Murderer, I watched the first five episodes was sent to me. Uh, I thought it was very well done. Candace Owens, again, I don't know who she is. I, I do now because I went to her social media page and found out she has quite a big following over 1.3 million people or something to that effect and people had commented on my Facebook page oh we love Candace Owens and I'm like who and these were like my my former co-workers and stuff and I was like who is she so I looked and it seems like she is a Republican I, and I don't know because I don't get into politics at all Zero. Okay. And there's a reason for that. Uh, and so it is the way it is. Did they, they pick her because she's, because it seems like people have made this into a political case. And that's so sad. It's so sad that true crime has come to that. 
that a case has to be political. But it, uh, apparently it is. I don't know the filmmaker. Again, I don't know Candace Ant Owens or The Daily Wire. I never heard of any of them. Okay? But I, they were nice enough, respectful enough to send it to me to review. So I reviewed it. If the filmmakers from Making a Murderer would have reached out to me and said, hey, would you review this for your thoughts? Uh, I would have done it for them, too, if they were respectful. I do that for everybody. You know, people reach out to me with cases all the time. Family members, friends. If they're respectful, yeah, I reply. I tell them yes, no, whatever it is. So it's I, you know, don't get it twisted and think I'm a Republican or something or I'm some sort of political view one way or another because I agreed to an advanced copy of this thing. Uh, that's ridiculous. But again, I'm not here to convince you one way or another. I am simply telling you that I reviewed it, thought it was a good show. It didn't tell me, well, I take it back. It, there were some things in there that I didn't know. Did it surprise me? No, it didn't surprise me. It was very well done. And I think it is a good retort to making a murderer. But again, it didn't change my mind. It didn't make me sway one way or another any more than I already did when I did an independent review of the case. But, wow, the hate spewed, at least to me, that I, you know, that's the only thing that I looked at. I don't get on social media and search up how people are responding to this, but, you know, a year ago, I got a lot of those hate comments, and now just a few days ago, I got a bunch more, and I didn't even say one way or another whether I, uh, what I thought, what my opinion was of convicting a murderer after I reviewed it. I just said it was great to get a true crime documentary that wasn't misleading. That's all I said, and everybody wanted to jump on that. It's amazing. Uh, and it's also amazing to me, I guess, that, uh, you know, these these trolls or whatever, uh, they think I care what they say, we, you know, I, uh, anyway, I don't want to get into the comments and those things and my hatred towards comments. Uh, I've done that before. You know, even Amazon reviews, I don't read, I don't read. Because people just are, are jerks and they just, some people are born with, with hate and they got to spew it and let it out any way they can. So, you know, it's funny to me that something gets a one star review because it arrived and it wasn't packed in peanuts. It was instead packed with, you know, air plastic material. So the product itself gets a one star review. Oh, Lord, what's this world coming to? But, again, uh, for you guys that are watching this, wanting to know specifics about the Stephen Avery case and what I think, you'll have to go back and watch my videos on it because it's been a, a while. And I'm not just going to go off of convicting a murderer and what I just watched because, um, believe it or not, that's... That seems to me to be biased as well. It's hard to say that because that seems to be pointing out truth more so than making a murderer. Even though making a murderer did have, it certainly had facts. It had truth there, but those were skewed to make you believe he was innocent. In convicting a murderer, it's probably the same way. They got truth there, without a doubt. And that's probably skewed a little bit to make you feel that he's guilty. Um, I guess it's so tough to get something in the middle of those that's just facts, right? 
Um, but again, I, I just thought it was a well done documentary. The first, I heard it was 10 episodes. You know, I think that's what they sent me an email originally saying 10 episodes, but I only got five to review. So out of those five, uh, I, I thought it was well done. Just like making the mur making a murder, I thought it was well done. It was a good documentary. Okay, but then when you start looking at things, you can see that they were certainly a little biased. They left things out. Now, why they did that to create great film, you know, to be suspenseful. I get all that, but it was dangerous as well because you're leaving out certain parts and you're. You're twisting the statements and leaving out certain, only taking like certain sections of statements and not letting it all play out. But the prosecution does that too, okay? Uh, it's all about winning, right? And sometimes I think we get wrapped up in that a little too much where it, it isn't, you know, just like it isn't political as much as everybody wants to make it political. And I'm so ashamed that true crime has become that, at least in this case, but there's other cases as well that, you know, if you believe that they're guilty, then you're one political party. Um, and I, now that I'm thinking about that, I, I think that maybe they, I don't know much about Candace Owens. I didn't research her, but some of the emails that I got saying about her being real political and I did jump on her social media and see a lot of political things being thrown out there. Um, maybe they should have chose a different host that wasn't so political. Maybe, maybe that is the answer. I, I don't know. I don't know enough about her to make that determination. Uh, I don't really care where her political affiliation lies. Um, but if this case is political, okay, you shouldn't have a political domineering figure hosting the show. Because then that certainly is pushing it one way or another politically. And I, I just don't like that. I don't like how everything in this world that you choose is become political. Pepsi or Coke? Pepsi. Well, you're a Republican. Democrats choose Coke. You know what I mean? Bottled water or tap water. It seems like every decision you make, they make it political. And it's not the public's fault. It's not our fault. It's the politicians' fault who make it that way. And I think that's so sad. That's not how politics are supposed to be. Now, here I'm getting off on a political rant, and I certainly... Don't mean to do that. I never talk politics because politics shouldn't be in true crime. But as an outsider looking in to this case and the information that I'm receiving, it seems that politics have bled into it. And it's sad. It really is. So, uh, let's see. What else? I, since I can't give any spoilers on that uh, I would just say that I don't I don't think that you're gonna see there's a lot of shocking things that you'll see that you probably don't know but whether it's enough to change a person's mind or not yeah it will but making of a murderer changed a lot of people's minds I'm sure as well but I got a lot of comments, or not comments, emails sent to me from uh, prison guards, district attorney's offices, all within uh, the Wisconsin area that know Stephen Avery, know his case. And I had not one that sent to me and said, hey, he's innocent. It seemed like all the people there know, knew, that he's guilty it's the masses that making a murderer reach through Netflix that you know started the protests 
um, out there in Wisconsin. And the whole bandwagon that's behind the Stephen Avery's innocence and you'll never you'll never change that and I'm not here to change that you do you okay but I'm just telling you what I see <laughs> and what I see is that he's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt I may I didn't need convicting a murderer to come out to tell me that but I think this is coming out, you know, Ken Krantz is on it. Um, he got a lot of ridicule in, in that. And you got to imagine these police officers, was it Colburn and uh, some of the others, their life was turned upside down because of this documentary. And I think that's extremely unfortunate. They get placed under a microscope anymore. Anybody does a suspect, you know, look at look at the Idaho case or the Delphi case when before the suspects, Koberger and um, oh, the other slap dick that got arrested. Was it Richard Allen? Before they were arrested, everybody had all these other suspects like the property owner. Was it Logan and not Logan Paul? Uh, whoever the landowner where Libby and Abby's body were found. That poor guy, he had nothing to do with it. And everybody, you know, in internet land wanted to jump on him. All these amateur detectives, they're not even amateur detectives. I don't, they're, I don't even know what they are. Just start going into his past and just ripping him apart. It's so unfair. So these police officers, district attorneys, and making a murderer are the same way. And I think of that with the Jennifer Hill case. Okay, there's people out there that believe that Kim Hubbard didn't do this case or do the crime, and that's fine. They believe what they want. But if a film company, film crew were to come in and do a documentary because they feel that Kim Hubbard is innocent, and it became a hit on Netflix, my life would be dragged through the mud because I was involved in it and I think that he's guilty. And so they could twist that to say, I fr and he has already, he's already said that I framed him. Okay. Um, which is the most ludicrous, asinine, immature, guilty thing to say, but they've said it. Okay. So a film crew will come in and they'll say, well, Ken Maines is dirty, you know, even though I've never been written, not even written up one time. And integrity is the most important thing to me. It doesn't matter. They'll rip it apart. They'll, they'll show in second grade I cheated on a spelling test. They'll go back and interview my second grade teacher. Isn't it true that he cheated on a second grade spelling test? Well, yes, it is. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. End of episode one, cliffhanger to episode two, to show my I have no integrity. You know what I mean? And then my life would just be ripped apart. And would I be upset about that? You're damn right I would be. Okay? But that's, that's the society that we live in. But we can still have empathy, which I do, for these police officers and district attorney's office who are being accused of framing an individual now again i'm coming at it from my opinion they didn't nothing of the sort nothing of the sort and the more i think about it if i was in their shoes i would sue the filmmakers of making of a murderer for what they did to me, looking, making me look like I had no integrity, make it look like I planted evidence. And I've never sued anybody a day in my life. I've been sued a couple times, somebody in true crime, actually. Somebody that goes to crime con. I blows my mind that people follow her. And she actually tried to sue me over the Zodiac case, saying it was her case. 
and people follow her. And Crime Con has her down there speaking. But I digress. So I've been sued. Um, but I'm not a sue happy person. But if somebody damages your reputation like that, it's very easy to say, yeah, let it go. But on a magnitude like that, um, and, and, I, and I guarantee the people who are around those police officers every day and work with them know that they didn't plan evidence and that they're good cops. But it's everybody else on that, that don't know and just know the show. And it's so unfortunate. And I, I, I have empathy for them. Uh, so if it happened to me, I would probably sue. I don't, can't say that for sure, but there's a good possibility, I think, that I probably, and maybe they have done that. Again, I don't follow the case. I'm not invested into true crime like some of these fanatics are. And a new true crime comes out, you know, they're on it and, and do clickbait videos and do all these things. I'm, that's not me, Okay. I like cold cases. That's what I do. That's what I've done for decades. So I like the older cases. This new true crime stuff that comes up, I don't get into it. You know, maybe once in a while I'll do a video on something because they request, but that's becoming fewer and farther in between. Just because I don't like what I see out there in true crime, and I've done videos about that in the past. Um, but, you know... I, whatever. Do your thing. I, I'm not the morality police, and I certainly am not here to tell somebody what to do in their life. I believe that everybody has a life to live, and you live it the way you want. Just because I don't agree with it doesn't mean I'm going to tell you not to do it, you know? I don't, I, I don't agree with you going, a, a YouTuber going up to a true crime victim's family's door and knocking on the door or camping out and saying, well, you're a suspect, so I'm going to interview you. Like, I don't like that. I wouldn't do it, but hey, do you. If that's what you want to do, who am I to tell you not to do it? Right? Be like uh, Jerry Rice playing for the Seattle Seahawks at age 45. Right? You want to remember him. Well, I do. As a San Francisco 49er, great, greatest receiver of all time. You don't want to remember him as a 45-year-old bumbling, you know, receiver for the Seattle Seahawks. But who am I to tell him that he shouldn't do it? And that cracks me up about athletes. And that's a whole other area. But I just don't like fans thinking they have the 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 God-given right to say all these mean things at sporting events, these ignorant, hateful, even racist things <coughs> to athletes. And the athletes can't do anything. They just have to take it. People calling their mom a whore, their sister, all these things, calling them a monkey, whatever it is. And they can't get mad. But then they say, hey, you're a professional athlete. Because you're in that position... You have to take it. That's wrong. It's a thousand percent wrong. We're still humans. You know what I mean? That athlete doesn't go to your work and heckle you. Our society's flipped up backwards. I'm telling you. That's why I prefer solitude in the mountains. I say it a million times. I don't like going and socializing, going and talking. I, I just don't. I just don't like the way society is anymore. And I certainly don't like the way true crime is anymore. But, you know, I don't want to get off on my thoughts about true crime and, and everything else. I just want to stay in my little bubble. Do my videos that, you know, apparently enough people like that I can continue to do this. And bring exposure to cases that, you know, don't get it in the media. And that's why Exit Unsolved, the new show that I'm doing, is so important because we're going to small towns and getting the cases that the media don't put out there. 
but they're just as important. So, certainly not saying that Stephen Avery's case isn't important, um, but just like Jennifer Hill case, you know, everyone wants to say the Kim Hubbard case, and it's not. Everyone forgets about Jennifer Hill. And this is called the Stephen Avery case, when it shouldn't be. It should be the Teresa Hollenbach case. That's how I see it. Sometimes the suspects get a little bit more media coverage and and fame, put that in quotes, than the victims. When it should always be about the victims. Okay? Um, anyway, my thoughts. I appreciate... Um, the people from Daily Wire and, and Candace Owens for sending me the advanced copy of that. I thought it was very well done. And I'll leave it at that. Making of a murder. Thought it was very well done. And I'll leave it at that. Stephen Avery. I believe he's guilty. I'll leave it at that. Stephen Avery supporters. Continue doing you, you know, if you believe that is the case, I'm not here to change your mind and I'll leave it at that. So with that out of the way, look forward to the next episode of something that is not Stephen Avery related and I'll move on to a next case that hopefully not too many of you know about and I'll be able to get that out to the masses and you'll be like, oh yeah. This is an interesting case. We need more eyes on it in order to solve it or move the case forward because that is what is important. Remember this, everybody, with these cold cases. Two things. It's not what you know. It's what you can prove. And secondly, there is no expiration date on justice. With that said, thanks for watching. Ains out. Bye.